All right. Welcome to Explain It to a Comedian. I'm here with my guest, Mara Faccio. Uh, how uh, badly did I say your name? Oh, it was perfect. Oh, I like no you offense. already. You, you're my favorite professor now. <laughs> that is what my students say before the final exam. <laughs> Somebody told me that you know a lot about and you enjoy horror films. Well, what's your top three? Shining has to be probably my top. Yes, uh, uh, Silence of the Lambs. And then I do like uh, the Dario Argento movies. They okay. were very popular in the U.S. Uh, in uh, the 70s, early 80s, like Inferno, Ooh. or Deep Red. You, you, you know your genre. So I take it you're not afraid of anything. If you watch horror, you're not afraid to take on corruption, for example. Um, for example, no. Speaking of horror, I also heard that in some way, uh, Berlusconi inspired your research. Is that true? Well, it is true, because uh, when I was a PhD student in Italy, or maybe even before then, uh, he became a prime minister. And at the time, uh, there were a lot of articles, uh, both in uh, the Italian press and uh, in the foreign press, uh, uh, raising accusations about the way he became a billionaire. And that uh, intrigued me a lot. Uh, and so because of uh, his uh, accomplishments, I started uh, to do research. Uh, and I soon actually discovered that, that uh, around the world that there were many more uh, various points. And so that uh, was like a perfect alignment of stars because I always like to do international and cross country kind of work. Uh, and so that presented a very interesting setting from my perspective uh, uh, to study, uh, for example, uh, the extent to which uh, combination between a political position and a corporate position adds or subtracts. To firm value uh, and uh, how it does so. Amazing. So, in your research, you found not just one Berlusconi, but many. Uh, what are the names of these other Berlusconis? Can you share? Well, some of them are very well known. So, like if you think of the former Indonesian president Suarto, uh, he's probably um, even a uh, bigger case. Uh, Obviously, in this case, he was running a country that was not a democratic and had set up a lot of businesses uh, for his uh, children uh, to whom he granted them monopolistic positions uh, or he protected them from competition. Uh, in Thailand, uh, Taksin Shinawatra uh, also uh, had a very similar uh, experience. In fact, it would Think of those as much more extreme cases. You know, I, I have some more questions about your about your research, but something that ties in between your research and your personal life is is you said that you like to play golf and you also like to study executives who play golf and post their scores as a way of gauging honesty or dishonesty. What have you found in your personal golf game, as well as your research on how people report their scores? Well, in my personal golf game, I find a lot of balls. Most of those are balls I lost probably in the previous rounds. Uh, there was some point where uh, I was conducting a study on uh, uh, golf scores reported by executives, but at the end, uh, in the end, we stop working on the project because it was too difficult for us to unequivocally uh, link uh, the name of an executive uh, to the name of the individuals who had reported uh, their scores on uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, Golf Association web page. And so we weren't really sure whether we were talking about the same people. But the idea was that uh, in golf, something that is very common, even uh, among uh, the very top players, is uh, being inconsistent. 
And so you have around the world very, very well, and then the next round of the uh, you feel much worse and have uh, 10 more strokes. Uh, and uh, what we were trying to see whether, uh, in fact, among the executives, there were people who were portraying that their performance, even as more consistent than the very top players, which was kind of implausible. And we thought it was kind of curious and interesting to look at, but unfortunately, again, we were not uh, sure about uh, whether the names we had were, for, with the gods, of course, were the names of the executives. Do you think that because of who you are and uh, what you research, that when your colleagues play golf with you, they become more honest just because they're around you? Is it some kind of uh, peer effect that you've created now that people need to be more honest around you as opposed to maybe they cheat when they play with others? I wish, I doubt it. <laughs> That's good. And and uh, and I've heard that in golf, you have to uh, learn how to golf well enough to make it look like that your boss is actually winning. So you don't want to beat them, but you want to play good enough that they think, oh, they know how to play, but I'm still better. So it's a very subtle kind of expertise you have to cultivate. Because if you're very bad, no one feels good about beating you. But if you actually are so good, you beat someone, they don't like that. So do you ever let people win because it's good business? Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not that good myself. So... Well, maybe maybe we should tell everyone you're very good. So when they beat you, they, they feel powerful and then they'll do, then you can ask them for favors. So uh -huh. uh, I, I'm trying to help you become more corrupt, Mara. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very difficult uh, to fake it. I can see that you're a very honest uh, researcher. So I want to ask a little bit more about another topic about uh, buyouts by politically connected private equity firms and elections. Please tell me about that research and what, what you found and why it's become so popular now. So the question we had, uh, uh, we were addressing uh, was related uh, to some earlier research and mentions of often reported in the press. Uh, that after buyouts, uh, uh, companies, uh, the target companies uh, experience a massive uh, reduction uh, in the number of uh, employees. And so uh, from the standpoint of workers, uh, the buyouts were allegedly uh, very, very, very negative events. Um, and in fact, uh, when Mick Romney went up uh, for presidential elections, uh, some accusations were brought uh, uh, in front of him, uh, given his experience in the private property industry. And so we wondered the first whether it was indeed the case uh, that the buyouts had uh, such a uh, disruptive uh, consequences uh, for employees, uh, as well as whether perhaps uh, this uh, outcome was not present uh, uh, when uh, the acquiring uh, firm uh, had political connections. Uh, the reason why that would happen uh, is that uh, at first, politicians don't want to match with companies that hire employees. Uh, that's bad publicity, especially prior to elections. Uh, and second, uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, politicians who may be able to provide uh, some favorable treatment uh, to companies, perhaps in their world of government contracts, perhaps try to get something in exchange. And so happy employees are possibly more likely voter for a incumbent politician. And so we investigated whether acquiring the firms uh, that have uh, politicians uh, uh, as uh, officers, directors, or in top positions are less likely to engage in acquisitions that result in employment cuts exposed. And indeed, uh, we find uh, that that was the case. Uh, there were two important results in the paper. Uh, one was that uh, the employment cuts uh, were not uh, super large, mm -hmm. as uh, some of the earlier papers had uh, suggested. 
but we were not the first of the document that is a uh, result. Uh, but the very first papers were overestimating the, the negative consequences of by our employees. Uh, and the second, which was uh, the novel result of our paper, uh, was that uh, when the acquiring firms had political connections, uh, we acquired the firm that did not fire employees after the acquisition. And this result would be especially pronounced uh, when the acquisition uh, took place uh, immediately for, uh, before presidential elections. Interesting. And did, what, did it vary based on um, in the United States, depending on which state, if it was a swing state or if it was, uh, was there any difference in between what state these PE funds were in or where they had their interests? So it, it, it varied depending on the level of corruption in the states. Uh, and so the results were more pronounced in more corrupt states. Uh, so the way we measured the corruption was by using uh, some existing indices, which uh, uh, were either based on perceptions of corruption across the states, or uh, they were based uh, on, uh, I think it was individual who were sent to jail for uh, uh, corruption related uh, offenses. Well, I guess this is not a good measure, but where I live in California, sometimes avocados can be four or five dollars. And I think that that's a sign of true corruption, but that's not a scientific measure, is it? <laughs> you should have them shipped from Indiana. The, the questions that, that I would have are uh, about um, how politically connected some of these public equity um, you know, shops are, how did you measure how politically connected they were? In the case of Mitt Romney, it's easy. He was running for office. He used to run a, a PE fund. Uh, but how do you measure if some of these PE funds no one's even heard of, like they're buying up HVACs or, you know, some other industry that I have no experience in? How, how do we find out if they have connections? No, so we do have some uh, incredible databases uh, that provide uh, uh, bios of uh, relatively highly ranked individuals uh, who are uh, working uh, that could be an employee or perhaps it could even be an executive uh, or a director, uh, certainly a publicly traded firms as well as a a variety of other companies uh, in certain industries. And so we used uh, one of those databases uh, and uh, uh, we uh, downloaded uh, the bios of each of the individuals covered in the data set, making sure that they were a certain rank. Uh, and then we used the keywords to pass their bios uh, to determine uh, whether these people uh, uh, had covered uh, certain uh, political positions. The next topic I wanted to talk to you about is the revolving door, um, which is, and correct me if I'm wrong, this, this flow of personnel from the governmental sector to the private sector. Uh, you and your team uh, wrote another paper on this. Can you tell me a little bit about it and what did you find? So that is a still in progress. Okay. Uh, and so what we are doing is looking at the flow of personnel from all uh, the government agencies uh, to the private sector in the US. Uh, and uh, we are focusing uh, on companies uh, for which we have better data quality in the sense uh, that we don't want uh, to have a bad feeling in the data, which could provide produce uh, some um, incorrect uh, or cause us to reach some incorrect inferences. And so we are present focusing on publicly traded uh, US companies, mostly for companies for which there is no bad feeling in the data. And so what we find uh, is that uh, transitions uh, from uh, uh, government agencies to top corporate positions are very common. I think that one every two large companies has a former government agency employee in a top 
corporate position. We are talking about U.S. companies. Yes. And so, so we're trying to right now, but I don't have any final results. So I'm not going to say much. We are trying to investigate how this correlates uh, uh, with contracts that the firms who uh, recruit these individuals uh, sign with the agencies at which uh, these individuals have experience. Well, I'll just have to wait and hear the results since you can't divulge anything now. But is this a good example or a bad example? So Al Gore was vice president of the United States. Then he lost his election to become president. And then now, uh, for, you know, at some point, I don't know if he still does, served on the board of directors of Apple. Is that part of the revolving door? Is that a good example? Is that a bad example? Or is there more insidious examples that the you know, the electorate doesn't even see kind of behind closed doors. So first, that would be a good example. I mean, an example that fits our characterization. Uh, and uh, uh, there could be good reasons for this revolving door to exist. Uh, we shouldn't presume uh, that it's a bad thing. Okay. And so that's the point of our paper. We are trying uh, to determine uh, whether our revolving door is a manifestation of perhaps a quid pro quo, mm. illegal exchange of benefits, uh, or if in fact it's something uh, that we should promote or at least allow uh, because it would uh, give uh, employees uh, at agencies uh, uh, the incentive uh, to invest in their human capital, improve themselves, and make uh, the agencies better while they are working for them. Uh, so this is a uh, type of question uh, that uh, we want to address. Right. So f for example, um, maybe your research can't speak to this quite yet, but uh, large companies, maybe Facebook, uh, Microsoft, US-based companies, they often have this position called governmental affairs or people who interact with politicians or, um, and what is the line between that and an industry group lobbyist? Is that part of the similar revolving door or bleeding into corruption? Or is that something completely different? So the companies try to influence uh, the political process in a variety of ways. Uh, and so in my research, I focused on something that very, very specific. Uh, which are transitions uh, from a uh, government or parliament to the private sector. Uh, but these are not uh, the only possible ways of uh, pressuring the perhaps politicians uh, to act leniently towards firms. And so other ways to consist of uh, maybe paying uh, contributions uh, during the electoral campaign, uh, perhaps uh, paying the bribe, since mm -hmm. we were talking about that. Uh, um, perhaps uh, uh, using uh, lobbying uh, uh, as a way to get favors. And if you look, you know, at cases at least of uh, corruption that are caught. I see. Uh, those tend to involve very large payments. Of course, uh, uh, the authorities uh, tend uh, to go after large cases. There is no point in wasting uh, uh, the time of uh, a lot of employees uh, to go after something that's trivial. Really, uh, oh. So it could be a very large case or somebody perhaps a very, very feasible. Interesting. It has to be big enough that they go after. So it has to be but not just... Mean, yeah, if, even if you look at some statistics reported there by the IRS, uh, the type of uh, companies that are eventually targeted uh, are not random. Size uh, does matter. Okay, size does matter. Thank you. So now I want to ask you about something I don't, I never heard about before I read your paper. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, who is Schumpeter? And what did this Schumpeter do? Am I even saying it right? Because this sounds like an important theory that I, I never knew about. And you are now uh, kind of an expert on this area. 
well, you overstated my expertise, uh, but Joseph Schumpeter was an Austrian economist uh, that uh, wrote his work in the early 1900, maybe it was published, uh, some of it around the 1920 and some uh, in the following uh, two decades. And uh, he wrote uh, about something uh, called the creative uh, distraction, uh, which is something uh, very popular in academia, especially in certain areas such as maybe finance, uh, economics, and the strategy. And so the idea there is that uh, innovation uh, brings prosperity. Uh, companies uh, that uh, repeat uh, the old uh, routines uh, don't uh, really uh, bring prosperity and don't contribute uh, to long term growth. And so, in uh, his writing, uh, uh, Schumpeter uh, said uh, that it's uh, usually not uh, the old innovators uh, that would launch the next great innovation. And in fact, he's, he was very clear in saying that if there are exceptions, exceptions could be rare. And so I may find something great today, but uh, you shouldn't bet on me repeating uh, the great discovery in the future. Uh, and so what we are doing on a paper that is also still work in progress uh, okay. that is uh, we identified uh, uh, the largest companies uh, circa 1910, which is a year for which we've had uh, uh, a lot uh, of um, good quality data. Uh, and we identified the largest companies uh, in uh, uh, about, uh, it was maybe about 50 modern day countries. I'm saying modern day countries because uh, the countries that existed in 1910 are different uh, from the countries uh, that exist today, and there are many examples. Uh, and so after we identified the largest companies, so we investigated whether these large companies that plausibly have been successful, and that might be the reason why they were large, whether they remain large, or whether, as Schumpeter predicted, uh, over time, uh, they disappear or become much smaller firms. Right? If it's true that uh, the innovator will not keep making the greatest discoveries over time, then their fortunes uh, should fade. Mm -hmm. And so what we found uh, was that uh, there was a lot of variation across countries uh, in the extent to which large companies remained large over a period uh, of 100 years. Because we started in 1910, so we can actually track these companies over a very, very long time period. Uh, and so we found a lot of differences uh, on average. I think it was almost 14% of uh, the large companies, uh, certain 1910, that were still uh, among the largest 20 in the 2018. Wow. The fraction that struck us is uh, amazingly high, but obviously that lies in the lines of the detail there. Uh, but what we then asked uh, is what are uh, the impediments uh, or things that uh, have allowed these uh, large companies uh, to be large. And so it could just be that they have access to a large pool of capital, and because of that, they are able to uh, find uh, innovation in terms Or it could be that these companies are sufficiently influential over the political process uh, that uh, they are able to obtain protection against uh, competition. Mm. And uh, they could do that in a variety of ways, uh, but one could be through the intro introductions of barriers uh, to uh, international competition. It could also be that these large companies uh, are perhaps, perhaps uh, linked to large banks, and because of their linkages to banks, they are able to start uh, their rivals of access to bank uh, financing. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so these are ideas that were proposed already at the time of Schumpeter uh, by Brandeis or Stephens, or the ability of companies to reinvent themselves was uh, pointed out uh, by Schumpeter themselves. And so we tried to investigate the extent to which uh, these ideas uh, were supported uh, by the data. And uh, what we found uh, was that uh, it seemed mostly, at least uh, for the very long time period, uh, that it's uh, the political influence as proxied uh, by the political connections, having politicians on boards, uh, that uh, what, uh, what was what made the difference. So even among the very, very largest companies, uh, having the politician increased uh, the likelihood that the company would still be one of the largest in their country 100 years later uh, by a lot. And so we then went ahead and said, well, but why does it matter? How can it matter, in fact? I mean, if a company is a terrible company, you can have a politician helping you, but you know, you're not going to win at the 100 meters at the Olympics. And so there has to be something more than that happening. So we speculated, uh, uh, borrowing also from some prior research, that it could be barriers to competition that allow those large companies uh, to remain large. And so we looked into the presence of those barriers. And we looked at two barriers. One were barriers to free movement of capital. Uh, and the second, uh, and so if you don't have capital, for example, you wouldn't be able to start the business. So you wouldn't be able to fund the innovation. And the second uh, were uh, barriers to trade. Uh, the idea is that uh, the dominant position of a domestic company uh, would be threatened in a free economy where trade is present. Because it's going to be possible to buy it. Uh, cheaper products uh, abroad or even better products. And so we investigated the extent to which uh, political connections allowed incumbents to remain dominant when restrictions to competition, to cross country competition, were present. And we found that it was the combination of political connections and legal restrictions uh, that uh, did the magic for, uh, for the companies. And so concluded that, that uh, the political connections on their own perhaps uh, are not uh, necessarily a problem, but because over the long run, you know, the Schumpeterian process of replacement of all the companies by the new innovators uh, seems to prevail when the political process does not uh, uh, introduce barriers of uh, competition. Interesting. Wow. So you're you're putting this new spin on a theory that's been around for a long time with uh, some interesting theories. I, I'm very close to Silicon Valley here and the mythology is that all startups are innovative and they're gonna do new things and they're gonna replace the uh, old way of doing things and overtake companies. And in certain cases that that's happened, like Google replaced the old search engines, but Innovation doesn't always do that, right? Because Coca-Cola is still Coca-Cola. Like I, I was trying to drink some herbal Coca-Cola I got at the health food store. It was terrible. I'm not drinking that again. But uh, does that have anything to do with what Schumpeter said or what you all are studying? So what Schumpeter did was to look at the creation, uh, which in his view was on the part of new firms, uh, which not all succeed. In fact, we know most of them fail. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, these, uh, these new firms, some of them are going to introduce something uh, that is uh, very new or that employs uh, the process of production that allows uh, cutting the costs substantially. Uh, and uh, so there is this creation, creative part of the creative destruction. And then this uh, creation uh, should result in previous creators uh, being supplanted by the new ones. And so our focus uh, is on the second part of the creative destruction, the destruction. Uh, are the old successful firms replaced or are they not? 
And so what we found was that uh, the replacement should not be preserved. Mm. So and I can't just as... intervene to regulation or that protects the position of incumbents. The Champetarian worker is not going to work, not even over a very long period of time. How do you gauge whether something is going to be worth your time or even interesting to others? So one issue or one point is uh, whether uh, that's a topic uh, that uh, receives attention in the press. The second is uh, one needs to be interested. Working in academia can be wonderful. Uh, but if you are not interested in the topic uh, that uh, you end up working on for years, it's going to be on the paradigm. Yes. Uh, and then it's uh, it's going to be important uh, to be able to uh, communicate what you are doing well, because at the end, uh, we want uh, to make a difference. Uh, it's not that we are writing our papers for ourselves. <laughs> that would be a complete waste of time and energy. Uh, and so we need uh, to be able to reach out uh, somehow uh, to the public to let them understand that, that maybe something is a problem or perhaps it is not a problem. Thank you. We are at our time, Mara. You have been such a delight to talk to. I, I learned so much about your research. You explained difficult things in a very easy way. But thank you so much for being with us at Explain It to a Comedian. 